Hello, and welcome. You are listening to Moodily Matters, the podcast that recognizes that your mood matters. Every episode, we talk to a range of amazing guests with experience in some of the top organizations in the world, discussing work life at the crossroads of mood, well being, and performance. Together, we aim to create better workplaces, one mood at a time. Let's get started with your host, Moodily founder, Erica First. Hello and welcome. I am Erica First, your host of Moodily Matters. My guest today is communicator extraordinaire, Kaylee Adams. Kaylee is the founder of Wilds District, a New York City-based design studio that specializes in emerging women's and e-commerce brands. She's made an art, a science, and a living with her finely honed communication skills. Today, she shares with us what to keep an eye on to maximize communication with partners, clients, and friends. And now on to the episode. So hello, Kaylee. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me today. Thanks so much for having me, Eric. It's great to chat with you. Thank you. Um, Why don't we start by getting an introduction of who you are? Yeah, so uh, I'm Kaylee Adams. I'm the founder of Wilds District. We're a design studio based in New York, um, and we work primarily with clients within the lifestyle and luxury sectors. So we do a lot of um, branding work. We do websites, apps, um, really everything on the design end of things, and it's it's a lot of fun. We work primarily with women-owned businesses. Oh, nice. And tell us a little bit about what you do for someone who might not be as familiar with the agency lifestyle and, you know, the challenges that you might face uh, during a day. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, a lot of my day to day um, as a founder now is really just taking a lot of calls and talking with a lot of people Um, every week. It's it's a bunch of new people that, you know, you get on the call with you, vet them, they vet you, you're talking through new business opportunities. Um, you know, you're also doing a lot of managing of the team as well of, you know, chatting through, checking in, making sure the work is getting done on time and, um, being done, um, up to, up to par and, um, and yeah, and presenting and sharing the work. So a lot of kind of interactions on a weekly basis, just kind of nonstop calls and emails. And, um, yeah, it's, I, I enjoy it. I really love, um, meeting a lot of new people, especially within the new business context. So you get to hear a bunch of really interesting and compelling business ideas too, which is fantastic. Um, so talk, let's move to your skill today, which we're talking about um, communication styles and being able to recognize different communication styles in other people. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting um, kind of skill set that I hadn't really realized that I had until later on, or never really had to develop, I guess, as much um, until I started my business, just mostly because, you know, especially on this Zoom world where we're all having back to back to back meetings, a lot of the times you're jumping from one call to the next, and it's very different from call to call, especially if this is the first time you're ever speaking with someone. Um, so a lot of the times our new business calls, you're getting on the on the phone, you're seeing someone for the first time and it's um, you, they might be totally different than the last person you talked to. So you really have to <clears throat> recalibrate as you go constantly. And yep. um, it's a challenge too, because I think particularly because we focus on working with women-led businesses, a lot of women out there, there are certain patterns you do start to realize there are like, you know, different types of people that you encounter and um, different communication styles. And and I guess as a whole, one of the trends that I notice a lot more about women is that we're more self-deprecating. I mean, I'm definitely, I fall into that bucket as well. And, um, but I think there's uh, value in acknowledging what is underneath that. I think that there's a lot of, it's easy for people to discount other people um, when they're just kind of casual or more bubbly or chatty or self-deprecating, but at the core of it, they're still doing really powerful things. Um, But yeah, it's, it can be a challenge kind of going from meeting to meeting where you really don't know um, on the next call, what personality you're going to run into and um, you know, what types of themes or topics will come up. Some people are more comfortable sharing, um, pitfalls, challenges than others. And some people are, um, yeah, it just really runs the full gamut of personalities. 
do you have like um names or a range like a list of the kind of characters or pers- uh, communication styles that you come up against yeah or uh, not come up against but yeah <laughs> encounter but yeah that I encounter yeah it's funny because i think um there's different types of people and it I, I think we're all a little bit of everything but it's like kind of more weighted in certain buckets for some people than others so you know there's definitely the type a type of person who comes in with a brief and they're like you know they have all of everything scoped out they've got the specs they've got everything they just want to talk business and so for that it's really not a lot of um, small talk that goes into the early stages you can kind of tell they they start to feel impatient pretty early on so that's a pretty early cue for me when people come in with a lot of preparation or they're asking for this that and the other kind of um uh you know deliverables up front it's really um getting down to business really quickly and and because of that type of personality you as a person interacting with them you really need to reflect the quality of who you are as well really quickly and and so you need to dial down a little bit um maybe you need to dial up the seriousness and dial down some of the more kind of small talk um, things because that's what those people are going to respond to. So that's definitely one type. The other type is really like the kind of chatty, bubbly, you know, person. And it's funny, I think at any given point in the week or year, you might shift in and out of all of these, like I was saying. Um, So for me, sometimes I, I fall into this bucket where I just, I get on a call. I really feel like I'm connecting with someone. I just want to chat. <laughs> and um you know, really connect with people right away and maybe, you know, tell personal anecdotes or personal, you know, small talk up front early on. Um, And I think that that can be fun. But like I said, to the type A type of people, it it can be a really, um, really kind of stressful or annoying um, type of thing to engage in. So there's that. But a lot of those people will come in They're They're more like looking to connect with you. They're looking to get a sense of who you are and less about like, can you do this work? They're more um, uh, inclined to respond to the type of personality fit and whether or not you'd be good for their business that way. So I think it also comes down to the priorities of what people are looking to get out of things. And so for some people, they weight um, expertise over personal style of communication, but for some people, it might be the opposite. Um And then there's kind of everything in between. There's people who come in um, really asking a lot of questions and really uh, being open about the things that they don't know. And I think that these people are really fascinating just because you have to assume that um, I think it's easy for people to assume that if someone's asking a lot of questions, they're not very intelligent in whatever subject matter they're asking about. But I actually think that those people are some of the smartest people in the room because they are asking those questions. So you imagine that in business that will suit them really well. Um, so there are some people come in and just say like, Hey, I have no idea what's how to go about this. Can you tell us what you recommend as the first steps for launching our business and getting a, a footing in the design realm of things? Um, and so, you know, for those type of people, you really need to spend a lot more time setting up all of the details and really going into depth. And, um, you know, they're, they're less interested about the high level information about you and the company. They're more interested in your process and, um, what you, what you've learned from and what you think works best. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, there's, there's many other types of people, but, you know, another thing that's helped me in the past, um, really getting into this type of psychology is there's this amazing book that I've recommended a number of times to everyone pretty much. Um, it's this, a book called Bargaining for for Advantage by G. Richard Schell. And it really, um, it's, not, it's more about negotiation, I think in the classic sense, but when you, you kind of get into depth halfway through the book, it really goes into just everyday um, types of interactions. And you realize that there's these kind of personality tropes that are out there that um, might sway people one way or the other to react in different ways to in conversations. It's just really, it was really enlightening and really insightful, I think, for, for me to read that. Um, okay. So that's great. And I think what's interesting also is that based on that person's communication style, you have to change kind of the role that you are like in yes. one, you're going to be more the, the friend or the companion, the other more of a teacher in the third, more of an expert. And I think this is, um, especially talking about communications as a skill, 
uh, one of the most fundamental things to recognize is that in order to successfully communicate, you have to speak to the other person in a language they can understand. Um, and that may not necessarily be the same for all people. So you have to be able to have that fluidity to take on a different role based on the person that you have in front of you. Yeah. Um, how could someone get better at recognizing another person's communication style? Because as you say, this happens relatively quickly. Um, and they may change again who they are, like maybe someday. Um, and it's actually interesting because uh, your communication style can also change based on your mood. People who are in bad moods tend to be more type A type. Like yes. th they don't, they're not interested in any fluff. They just want to like, let's just get this done. Um, yeah. When you're in a good mood, you actually are less attentive to details. You want to keep the good mood going. So you try and perpetuate pleasant conversations or to pleasant topics. You want to stay in that um, good area. And the, um, the, the curious to me, the, uh, I love curious people because they're, in my experience, the ones who make the best clients yeah. <laughs> because, because they're open. Um, and uh, not not guidable, but they are uh, sort of intellectually critical or critical thinkers. Like they listen, they process, there's conversation and then they make a decision. So to me, it's almost like, you know, a little bit um, the fairest. But how, how can you get better at recognizing a communication style? Uh, yeah, I think... I think the first thing is really just practice, right? It's like going out there and talking to as many people as possible. And um, a lot of the times I think we kind of get into these patterns of talking to, to the people that we know, and um, that just becomes our normal day to day. But when you're forced to go out into these positions or like moments where you do have to talk to people that you wouldn't otherwise talk to, that's obviously a great way to get better at it. Just because you, I think when you get into these bubbles of talking to the same people um, over time, it really can be isolating and kind of self perpetuating or kind of self fulfilling prophecy of kind of, you, it makes you think that the the rest of the world is really like this little group that you're a part of. Um, right. The famous echo chamber. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, even, you know, it sounds like a daunting uh, thing, but even just talking to people, um, you know, you're in line at the store, you're, you, you know, you're um, going out and you're at the coffee shop, you talk to the person who's making your coffee, really just like kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations wherever you can find the the chance to do it is really important um just because i think it challenges you to stay on your feet and kind of learn how to respond or learn how to to riff off of other people it's almost i see it kind of almost like comedy or improv where you know one person says something and then you're tasked with finding the appropriate or you know a response that you think fits and so when someone throws you a curveball you know they might just be some type of person where you would never even talk to those types of people um so it's kind of a, a fun challenge to throw yourself out there um one of my favorite exercises is going out to a bar or a restaurant and um I like to sit alone at the bar <laughs> it's just it's weird but you know you can kind of like get into some interesting conversations with people. And I think that just turning to the person next to you and asking like, Hey, what'd you order? That looks good. Or, um, you know, talking with the bartender asking if like, this is the regular crowd. It's kind of interesting just to get into these small conversations. And there's so many ways to do that. So that's the biggest way I think to learn how to respond is just by practice. It's just doing it, you know, like, like anything. Um, but I think also the thing to one thing to that helps with getting better at um, figuring out how to adapt is just really being um, present and being um, focused on different people's responses. So looking for nonverbal cues is a really good way as well. So if somebody is kind of squinting or looking, you know, like a little bit um, off to the side or not really, like you might uh, pick that up as a subtle hint that 
something isn't clicking, right? So you can try a different tactic or a different approach in the next sentence. So it's really like an ongoing thing. You can kind of, some people, when I find people that really stump me, I'll kind of go through five different things really quick, like five different approaches um, (laughs) until I get something that seems like a flicker of interest or some kind of a head nodding or, um, you know, uh, or a, you know, a look of engagement in their eyes, but it's, it can be a challenge sometimes when you're trying to quickly process someone. And oftentimes it needs to happen really quickly in order for you to make a connection. So you have to like really quickly respond and try different tactics, but looking at how people are responding to you is really, I think a a good way to, to gauge um, the responses. And these five different approaches that you use, what might they be? So my default that I always go in in with is um, just friendliness, being upbeat. You know, I think that that is my default personality. And um, for many years, I definitely tried to mask that to come across as more professional or more uh, experienced when I realized that there's really no um, problem with being nice, right? It doesn't cost you anything. And if somebody thinks that you're not sophisticated or not, you know, um, talented or whatever, just because you're nice, then that person, you know, might not be the right person to work with, be friends with, whatever, just because, you know, there, there's something weird there, right? I think like it's, it really didn't cost you anything to be nice, but, you know, sometimes in a professional setting, if you're having a conversation, you come in too friendly, you know, it can, it can backfire. So if that doesn't really work, I'll try to start asking questions as the next one, because sometimes, um, just asking questions and being kind of curious will open people up and give you a good segue into like, okay, what might be a good topic to hit on next? Um, some people, if they seem really off put by just friendliness right off the bat, you might come in and readjust and become a little bit more serious. Um, so I find that that's kind of the easiest way, but when in doubt, I always ask questions that seems to work because it kind of buys you a little bit of time, but it also allows you to um, pry at different subject matters that might be uh, a good overlap or a good conversation. Um, but having that said, some people are really difficult to get anything out of. So you might ask questions and if someone's giving you, you a yes or a no, um, it's really going to be a challenging thing to kind of keep pulling at that thread. So sometimes when people are just giving me yes or no answers, I'll go ahead and kind of volunteer something like, hey, I saw this show last week or, oh, did you see this brand launch this thing the other day? Um, so you can kind of keep the conversation going in that way as well. Um, and you can you can start asking questions that require more of a elaborate response rather than yes, no. You can say like, what did you think about this or that? Um, you know, and, and, and try to get around it that way. Um, do you find that there are certain questions? Cause like even the idea of going to a bar and being like, Hey, what did you order? Is this the regular crowd? Like, um, small talk is an art, right? <laughs> Icebreakers ice are an art. Um, do you have any go-tos that are really, because also like in the asking questions, that may be some place where, you know, someone might get thrown off, you know, and perhaps you right. ask like a really personal question and oh, yeah. <laughs> accidentally put the other part. So what are some really good sort of safe icebreaker questions that could maybe get the other person talking a little bit more? Yeah, well, my biggest one that I always like to do is... Um, well, there's the obvious ones, right? That everybody's, oh, the weather, or, <laughs> you know, whatever those obvious ones are. But aside from those, right? Um, I think that the best way to try to talk to somebody is ask, like, what do you do? What are your hobbies? And then if someone says, oh, I'm in finance or, or whatever their answer is, you could say, oh, did you, what do you think about, you know, the Fed interest rate hikes, you know, and you might tap into someone that way. Or if someone says, oh, you know, I'm into art. Oh, have you seen any cool shows lately that you would recommend? Um, I'm really interested in trying to find some new shows. So it's really just kind of, um, I take a question about what they do um, or what their hobbies or passions are, and then try to ask a follow-up question based on that. Um, Because allowing someone to speak to their expertise also really helps kind of bolster them up and open them up because nobody wants to talk on a subject matter that they really don't know anything about. Uh, it could be really uncomfortable. So 
I think a lot of the times if you ask them um, a question about something that they're deeply knowledgeable about, it not only will teach you something and be really interesting in that aspect, but it allows them to bring forth like their best uh, kind of qualities or interests. They can really shine in that moment and it opens people up and makes them feel a lot more comfortable. Yes, people, uh, there's like a big dopamine rush that comes when people yeah. talk about themselves. So it's a, yeah. it's a great, <laughs> great way to put somebody in a good mood, to talk to you, to be welcoming, is to let them uh, talk about themselves or something that they care about or something that without challenge, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. Um, what about if someone comes to you and they're unpleasant? How do you manage that? Uh, well, I think there's some there's different kind of levels of unpleasantness, right? Sometimes it's, it's you know, um, there, there are very few people that I meet that I am kind of like thrown off by. And mostly because I just try to imagine a scenario where somebody... Uh, how, why somebody might behaving a certain way. So, um, you know, I might imagine like, oh, they just got off a really bad call or, oh, they're really stressed out. They have a crazy busy week. Um, you know, I think a lot of people just take people's personalities at face value and just don't think any further. But if you can kind of imagine the scenarios that might make that person seem more rushed or seem more dismissive or stressed out, you realize that everybody has good and bad days. And so sometimes it just helps to make up a story that's like, okay, this person seems to be really like a busy person. And, you know, they're, they're really absent from this call. They don't seem like they're even in this conversation right now, they're off, uh, you know, checking their phone or doing these things while you're, you're trying to talk to them and engage them. Um, and so sometimes it's just giving up people grace, I think, and, and trying to, acknowledge that everybody has other things going on in their life. And, um, you know, it's really, I think once it becomes a pattern, it, if it's, it, you have to remember that too. Anytime you go into a conversation, um, it's a one-off thing. Whereas if you were to know that person and get to know them, maybe, you know, it might not always be that way, but if it's a pattern, it's a little bit more of a challenge, I think, to interact with them at that point. If there is behavior that's kind of more of a, a categorical issue up every time. I just try to, you know, keep things as brief as possible, as professional as possible, and kind of continue to just move on from there. I, I try to not, you know, um, say, you know, elaborate on conversations or take too much time on calls because clearly there's something, you know, there, there might be something not clicking there for them. Mm. Um, sorry, I'm just finished writing what you were saying. Um, Yeah. I, uh, so when you have people that are difficult like that and who are, you know, dismissive, um, I find also from some of the research that I've done that the more objective you can be in the conversation, but in the content yes. of the conversation, literally like stick to the facts, stick yes. to you know, uh, no opinions, things that can't be um, debated necessarily so that there's no right or wrong. It's not a question of perspective. Uh, and with yeah. people like that, I think you also want to make sure that there is some sort of documentation of what was said and what was agreed. Um, yes. So that, you know, there's a, in Italian, we say carta canta, which means the paper sings. <laughs> so if it's printed um, yes. somewhere and agreed, then uh, I find it's easier because uh, if it's a pattern, if it's a tendency. So if somebody's in a really bad mood and is kind of nitpicky and stuff like that, they are going to want evidence of what was discussed. Um, that's sort of a common thing. If somebody is difficult by nature, um, it's a, a good sort of protection mechanism on your own to be like, this is what was stated. This is what was agreed. This was that. Many times communication styles is also a reflection of our psychological motivators, right? Yeah. Do you find that there are clues in their conversation, how they speak, what they speak about that reveal what the driving psychological motivator is, like what they want out of this conversation? Yeah, I think from a business perspective, um, 
I always like to ask people what inspired them to launch their brands. I think it's a good segue into the motivating factors for it. So some people might have really, I mean, just dr- drastically different answers person to person. So some people might say, this is the business I've always wanted to do. They have a personal connection, a personal story to it. And that's fantastic. So, you know, it's a more personal personal kind of motivation. And so you can tell that when you engage in business with them from that point on, it's something that's really deeply connected to them and their psyche and their um, identity as a person. Some people, you know, will say, hey, I saw this really interesting market opportunity. And um, I went to Wharton and, you know, found this was a untapped market. And then you're like, okay, they're more of a business minded person. They're thinking about the numbers, the data. So that type of person you might imagine might be someone you need to really deeply explain every kind of decision to, because that will be, that logic will really be strong for them in terms of um, making a compelling argument for this, that, or the other. Um, But that's always helpful for me to find out like uh, the main drivers for them behind the business. Um, Personal, you know, it takes a lot more chatting, you know, I think to understand the what drives a person um, in their normal day-to-day life, but knowing more of their backstory. So just coming back around to asking a lot of questions helps because you might find, you might hear these little anecdote stories of their childhood or um, a past experience or things like that, that you can start piecing together and starting start to learn from them about what, um, what experiences they've had and how they've reacted to them and how that might drive them as a human being today. And, you know, it's not to say that all your past experiences really make who you are. I think some, some bit of who you are is always evolving and changing, but it's a good indicator of different things that you value. Um, But yeah, in business, it's much easier to find out. Um, And so on that note too, if there's ever feedback or any kind of piece of um, business, you know, um, any, any part of a project where we might not agree with the feedback um, and say like, okay, well, uh, we'll just ask, walk us through this thinking here. Um, you know, you wanted, to, we want this to look more like X, Y, Z, you know, what's the biggest driver behind that? Um, and a lot of the times you, what you'll find is that you might be thinking that they're coming at it from one way. And then when they start to elaborate, you realize it's actually, it might be a totally different driver or reason behind uh, it, that type of feedback. So it's interesting because if you disagree with someone on a certain piece of feedback and ask why, and they give you an answer, you might realize like, oh, you know what? There's actually this other, you know, you're over here, I'm over here, but there's this third kind of road we can go down. That's a middle point in between now that I know why you want that. Um, so you can find really easy solutions um, to kind of uh, appease both once you know why they are wanting the things that they want. Yeah, absolutely. And I think my, I think the most important question everywhere is always why, like, why did that happen? Um, And when I, I know, especially like in conversations like that, if you ask someone, instead of taking it as face value, especially in the line of work that you're in, you could have like an account executive who you give the feedback and they just write it down. But if they ask, can you explain a little bit more about why you made that choice or about what you don't like about this in your elaboration of that, there comes out an area where they can fix it because otherwise it just becomes a question of, I like, I don't like. Um, And so in that why, Um, asking people to explain why they're saying certain things, why they've chosen certain things, and also you explaining why you've said certain things or chosen certain things is the area that creates the possibility for options of solutions. If it's just, I don't like this, or I don't want this, there's, it's, people have to then guess in the dark what it is that you do want or what it is (laughs) that that you will like, right? And it's, it's interesting because it's a skill and you don't realize that it's a skill. Sometimes Um, I went, I uh, went to art school as a background. um, And I always tell people that the biggest thing people say, like, what, why would you go to art school? That makes no sense. You know, (laughs) because you can do that. And yes, you can. But I think the biggest thing that comes out of an education like that is that you, you begin to understand how to articulate the reasons behind things. So 
all of the teachers in that type of context will always teach you like stand by the decisions on the art that you made. Even if people don't like it, if you have a reason for why you did it, that's valid. But if you have no reason at all, you're standing on pretty shaky grounds. So, right. you know, make sure that there's a, a purpose behind the decisions and make sure not only that, but make sure you're able to articulate it, which I think is what people um, ha- struggle with. And so I think, um, like when I first started dating my husband many years ago, I would, I took him to a art museum and I was walking around with him and I was asking him, which pieces do you like? And he would point to one and say this one, I'd say, why? And he's like, I'm not really, I don't know. Um, right. And, and I realized like over time, he started to be able to develop a language of articulating um, specifically what he doesn't like, but it dawned on me at that moment in particular that this is not a skill set that everyone has inherently. And so part of our process for design, whenever we're doing um, design work with people is we'll do this mood board phase, which is really all about educating people about design systems and language and allowing them to kind of, um, it's a, it's kind of a quick and fast uh, introduction to explaining how visuals can make people feel because of certain things um, and certain lever- levers that you might be able to push and pull. So it is a it is a, a skill, and it's it's easy to forget that, especially when you're so into something or you're so kind of proficient or an expert, it's easy to forget that not everybody is at the same level. So you do need to do a lot of education there around. Um, allowing them to to kind of get brought up to that level where they can articulate things as well. Um, Because especially with visuals, a lot of people know it, it's a yes or no, but they've never stopped to think why. And uh, that can be really helpful. Yeah. And I found, and, and I think this is actually a great practice element that anyone can do because we are very rarely asked why we are always asked what, you know, do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you want this? Do you not want this? Uh, because we're cognitively efficient, right? And why takes a moment. You gotta, you gotta stop the the front brain and go into the deep one and be like, why don't I like this? What you know? What's it bringing up for me? That's um, hard, and that takes time and practice, as you said. Um, but I think it's a great and very important skill to develop to ask yourself, why don't I like this? What about it is not pleasing or like what about this is pleasing you know I, I like that color what about it it makes me feel huh, it reminds me of this that getting in touch with that ability to articulate why you're choosing things actually improves your ability to communicate and get what you want not in the sense of manipulation but obtain your objective from other people because you you create a broader spectrum of information that they can process it through as opposed to, I don't like it. And I think for people who don't have the tools to articulate why, sometimes it feels very catastrophic. So we've, right. had, where we've gotten feedback and it's like, this is just so far from what we were looking for. You know, it's very rare to get this, but we've right. got it. And then you dig deeper, you ask why, and you realize, oh, you just really don't like the color purple, or you really don't like this font. That's like one button click where it just yeah. changes it throughout. <laughs> and you show it and they're like, oh, that's so much better. And yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> I've lived it many times. Um, so let's talk about what happens, like the downside, our inability to recognize communication styles or our inability to adapt our communication styles to another? What could happen? I mean, I've definitely seen relationships, uh, you know, get tricky with when you're not reflecting or asking why. Um, And I think, especially in the business sense too, um, it can be tough when, you kind of are are in this point of um, trying to find the deeper level meanings behind everything, but you don't feel like it's reciprocated. That can always be a challenge because it can feel like you're doing a lot of the like work to really move the client through the process and cater to them and help them, but they're not really come trying to understand from where you're, uh, you know, the the point of view from which you're coming from. Um, so that can be a challenge, I think, in the process because it can be tough, um, especially if you are having a bad day and you're starting to think like, gosh, these people are just really, um, you know, not listening to why we're doing, why we're t- 
talking about this event. Like I said, luckily it's extremely rare for us now, um, particularly I think just because we have decided to work with, you know, a lot of women in our business. I think like women in general kind of have a deeper level of understanding of emotional kind of depth and um, all of that, not to overgeneralize, but I think that there's kind of a, a emotional maturity there a lot of the times with, with women. And, um, but I have seen it kind of break down in communications or projects where it maybe isn't a two-way street and it can sometimes um, lead to a feeling of burnout or um, kind of uh, a feeling of being under not heard or not understood. Um, so it's really important, I think, to constantly check in with who you are and um, how you're coming across and how other people are are coming across to you too. Um, otherwise, you can find yourselves in these yourself in these echo chambers that we're talking about, where like you kind of live in a bubble, um, and it, that you're not going to get the best result. I think either if you're constantly just kind of talking to the people you know will give you the right answer according to you know your own personal tastes and preferences. Yeah, that's interesting. The idea of being sort of limited um, in what you're able to do and what you're able to produce and, you know, where you can go in professionally and or personally, if you don't have that sort of breadth of um, communication experience. And one of the things I also wanted to mention, you know, on top of you, the what you mentioned, like the idea of being disconnected from the other person, a sense of burnout that comes from emotional labor, which is having to put in sort of all the emotional work and something, um, a lack of connection is also a last, a, a lack of trust. Um, that if there is, if there isn't that sense that like, I get that you get me, or I get that you're listening to me, or I get, that you've heard and understood what I said without that, then you don't have any trust. And that means that everything you bring me, especially in service industries, I'm going to be highly skeptical of because I've, I don't feel like you understand what I've said, what I mean, who I am, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which obviously creates a tremendous problem in, especially in professional relationships. Yeah, I think in um, a lot of bigger organizations too, you do see sometimes breakdowns happening between teams for this reason, because the people um, on one team might be in an echo chamber. They're all in line with how things should be done, the priorities, they're in line with um, their own belief systems, but then they might, let's say it's a design team, they're taking it to the marketing team. They have their own sets of beliefs and they might clash with the design team. And, you know, um, I think kind of corporate tensions come up that way as well, where people maybe aren't, uh, are, are too much in their own group um, or not asking enough questions and are just looking for the people around them to really support that opinion. Because, um, you know, it can lead to a lot of tensions across functions in companies. And so I think you know, there's a really, there's an important value of seeing other people in different teams as human and trying to understand where they're coming from, because it can really, yeah, slow down overall output and productivity. It's not even, it's, you know, I think people talk about this type of skill set as a very soft skill set, but it's really a, a functional foundational skill <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if you have a corporate structure where your teams are not working together, you're losing money. So it's, it's critical. Yeah. Yeah, I would say, you know, communication, I, and I don't remember a, a, a statistic I saw, but it was something like in any communication written or whatever, if the person is not completely like tuned in and well-skilled with communication abilities, they're losing about 70% of the intended meaning of what's coming at them. That's, in, I mean, it's like everything, you know, yes. you understood. Hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, I'll, I'll wrap it up here because otherwise we could go on for hours. I know. I, I love, I love this. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us where people can find more about you and about your design studio. Yeah. Um, so you can definitely check out us and our work, uh, wildsdistrict.com. That's W I L D E S district.com. And, um, yeah, we're on Instagram as well. Wilds district there as well. And if anybody wants to reach out and email me directly, I'm Kaylee at wildsdistrict.com. And, 
Um, honestly, I, I'm happy to always take calls and um, emails and things. I just love to chat with people and love connecting. And so, you know, happy to help um, people uh, with any kind of advice or just to talk through things. It doesn't always need to be kind of a business, uh, you know, uh, inquiry. It can be anything. So, yeah, just reach out. I'd love to to hear more from people. Awesome. Well, thanks again for being here today. This was great. Yeah, thank you so much. It was so great chatting with you. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Moodily Matters. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort. And we'll catch you in the next episode of Moodily Matters.